it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 172 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton, but most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA. Bantam Coffee Roasters. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Today we are brewing my favorite of the Bantam Roasters offerings, the Kenyan coffee. That is your favorite. We brew it a lot. Now, where can everybody go and get their cup of Kenyan coffee? Bantamroasters.com. And use the code FLUFFYBUTT for 10% off anything on the website. It's a great code. Go use it and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Are you ready to sip some of this delicious Kenyan coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubly Farms. They're here, new and improved, Grubly's World Harvest. I'm a longtime subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, plus orders $40 and more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein, perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. Grubly Farms makes food and treats for healthy pets and planet. To support us and Grubly's, go to our website or our show notes and use the link. Try it today. Okay, so how are you doing today? Pretty well. How are you doing? Good. I mean, we are busy, woman. We have been (laughs) busy. Super busy. Super busy. Now, we're trying to get all these interviews out for you guys, and we book out weeks in advance. So we're busy all along for the future. So when you hear an episode, it was probably recorded a few weeks before. Not probably. It was recorded a few weeks before. And man, we're busy. Yeah, tell me about it. It's a really good busy, really, really good busy. Now, some of this is complicated by the fact that my co-host has decided to run off to Mexico. (laughs) Yeah. So while we're recording this, it's just a few days before I have to go away for a few days out of the country to Mexico. It's it's a business trip. I have to go away for a few days. It's not our business trip. (laughs) It's my hubby's business trip. So yes, I have to go. So we're doing basically a few weeks of recording in just a few days. So that's why Holly's voice is a little stressed. Well, I mean, I haven't gotten it back from being sick and this has not helped it. I will say that I spent most of today writing the brief spotlight for this episode. So there's not much about the brown leghorn. I don't know at this point. That's good. good. If the brown leghorn were a category on Jeopardy, I would run that category. I would run the board. Now, yesterday was a day we worked in person, and this is a funny thing. And I'm going to let you guys in on a little thing that happened because it was funny. But we're at the table for the first time in like a month and a half because we worked on Zoom so much because of the illnesses. When we would cough, you can hit mute on Zoom so that your cough is not on the recording, right? right? So we're at the table yesterday. And we're recording live in person and I have my laptop in front of me and I'm trying not to cough. And then I go to my laptop to hit mute. And I'm like, shoot, we're in person. It was really funny. It was. I was like, there's no mute for in person. (laughs) No. And then sometimes when I had to cough, I would hit the pause button. And then we would both start coughing. (laughs) It's the last to go. It's the last to go. We are still coughing with the chicken ladies. It's unfortunate. (laughs) We are. Well, on that note. If you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. If you listen to us on Spotify, we would love some of those five-star ratings over there. And hit that subscribe button on both because that way you never miss an episode. And I keep saying it, but they count them. If you're looking for other ways to support the show, you can tell a few chicken-loving friends about us. You can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can check out our Etsy shop. Mugs, t-shirts, tiny chickens. You can become a patron of the show. Patreon.com slash Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. Our top two tiers get a bonus episode each month. I really feel like the last two we've done have been super fun. We did the history of vet sexing, which was fascinating. And then we did a really fun history of Easter egg. So yeah. The other thing you can do if you'd like to help support the podcast is visit our website and our show notes. 
Use our affiliate links and discount codes and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the Chicken Love Box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the mega box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the February box, I absolutely love the spray bottle of Bye Bye Boo Boo's and the rooster cheese spreader knife. I love the Chicken Lady Era hat and tea. They're great. And you can't go wrong with that coffee with the Chicken Lady's mug. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals health products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business, working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. Love is in the air, la la la, it's a breed spotlight. I think I see where you're going with this one. You are the Italian lover. I am, I am. Your black and red hair. <laughs> Yes, that's me. That's me. Okay, so this week's breed spotlight is the Italian. Round leg horn. It's Italiano, just like me. Now, we all know that you have Lucy. Beautiful, beautiful Lucy. And Lucy's a white leg horn. She is an extraordinary little girl. But these are my first leg horns. So I'm getting a brown leg horn and a silver leg horn this year. Lucy's going to be so upset with you. I don't think she will. I think she'll, she'll like it. She'll have other leghorns around. She'll have leghorn cousins. Leghorn cousins. Yes, leghorn cousins. I named them. I name my birds before I have them most of the time. Catherine de Medici and Lucretia Borgia. Are they going to be hanging out with Fuffer? (laughs) Fuffer is a goose and stop calling her that. (laughs) I'm not going to be able to call her anything but Fuffer. That's what I'm going to call her. Oh, my God. No, they're probably not going to be hanging out for the, with the geese. It's certainly not for a while. The geese are not going to be necessarily chicken guards. There's a lot I need to learn about geese, so they're going to have their own nice big space as I learn more about them. <laughs> so the brown leghorn, the beautiful brown leghorn, Catherine de' Medici, is generally known as the most colorful of the leghorn varieties. Oh, yeah. They're beautiful. It's probably why they're popular show chickens, but we really think that they should be much more popular with backyard chicken keepers than they are. They're so colorful that at one point, I thought Gertie could have been a brown leghorn. Yes. yes, You remember that when I started doing the investigation of Gertie, since Gertie was supposed to be an olive acre, she definitely wasn't. And then we came to the realization that she was a well summer, definitely a well summer, but to get to that point, I thought she might have been a brown leghorn because brown leghorns are colorful. They're really beautiful. Right. And the well summer also is that sort of partridge colorway. And the difference is the white earlobes. That kind of right. is a little bit and of the, the difference. the body shape too, I would say. The right. Shape. Now, the brown leghorns come in two different shades of brown. But for this spotlight, we're going to concentrate on the light brown, not so much on the dark brown. You can also get your brown leghorns with either a rose comb or a straight comb. Right. So you have a little bit of difference here. Catherine de' Medici will be a straight comb. The rose comb, though, is an excellent option if you're in a cold climate. Mm -hmm. But that big straight comb is a must if you're in a very hot climate. They use that to let off the heat. I mean, we're in the mid-Atlantic, so it's definitely better to have the straight comb. And you make provisions in the winter, so she'll be fine. Brown leghorns are considered a heritage breed variety, 
and they are currently listed in the recovering category of the Livestock Conservancy's conservation priority list. I feel like leghorns across the board have had a little jump. I mean, leghorns are always popular, but I feel like there's a new look at the leghorn. And I like to think that maybe we're a little bit of a part of that because sometimes the leghorns were getting a bad rap, but they're not. Right, right. Well, I feel like the Mediterraneans in general really have needed a little push and a little more information about them. I think they're the most enchanting chickens. They're fun to watch. They're just amazing. They're great layers. I love them. We covered the early history of the leghorn pretty well in episode 85. So if you just want the general history, go back there to episode 85. And if you want the really early days, go to episode four. That was also a leghorn. Okay, yeah. (laughs) It was fun. Very early days. That's the one where I said I was going to be calling my Leghorn, Legorno, Legorno. Legorno. Come back to me, Legorno. We also have a Leghorn breed spotlight over on McMurray Hatchery's blog. So that's another good place to get some Leghorn info. Essentially, we're just going to sum up the history of the Leghorn. They have existed in Italy for hundreds and hundreds of years. We are not sure what they were called by the local people. But we do know that people in other European countries often refer to them as Italians or even occasionally Sicilians. Okay. They evolved in the warm Mediterranean climate to have those big combs and waddles and the tight feathering with sparse fluff. And that was to help them release heat and keep them cool. And like most of the Mediterranean breeds, they were selectively bred to be excellent laying hens. The brown leghorn was the first of all of the color varieties to arrive in the U.S. Now. If you do a lot of reading on this, you're going to find that historians disagree on the year of the first importation. But both Lewis Wright and Frederick Ayers offer some evidence that brown leghorns first arrived in New York in 1835. Apparently, this point has been hotly debated for decades, with others maintaining that the first importation was actually in 1853 in Boston Harbor. I mean, the numbers are reversed. Is that right? The number, yeah. <laughs> 35 and 53, yeah, yeah. I'm like, wait a minute here. I mean, that's like too much of a coincidence. Boston, New York, I don't even know. <laughs> I'm inclined to think 35 would not be too early. I'm inclined to think they probably came in in 1835. White leghorns were the first color exported from the U.S. to the U.K. And Lewis Wright himself imported the brown leghorns in 1872. He loved himself some brown leghorns. He does. He really devotes a lot of time to the leghorns. He's also a huge fan of the the Plymouth Bard Rock, interestingly enough. He's a man who loved his chickens. Very much. He did love his chickens very, very much. Brown leghorns were present at the first U.S. poultry show, and they made a great impression. The single comb browns were accepted by the APA in 1874. That was the first printing of the Standard of Perfection. The rose comb browns were accepted in 1883. At the time, there was no distinction made between the dark and the light brown birds. And so there was some squabbling going on. There was some, you know, exactly, right? To avoid confusion, the APA divided the straight comb browns into light and dark varieties in 1923. And then they did it again in 1933 for the rose combs. They made a dark rose comb and a light brown rose comb. There are a surprising amount of books that are written specifically about the leghorn including this one. This was really interesting because you could get the full text on Google Books. It's a book written by H. Hudson Stoddard in 1879, and it is called Brown Leghorns, How to Mate, Rear, and Judge Them. Okay. He wants to do all three things. Apparently, yes. (laughs) I mean, they really have been popular show birds as well from the beginning. I mean, they're beautiful birds. And the thing is, the brown leghorn, the people who have brown leghorns, they fiercely love their brown leghorns. Yes, they do. So they're both leghorns, but to be honest with you, they're really treated like totally separate breeds. They are. Because the white leghorns, I mean, people who have brown leghorns really don't really want the white leghorns. They have the brown leghorns and they're happy with that. Right. So we might have a divide between us because I'm the white leghorns. More of a divide than the geese have already caused. (laughs) That's just fun to joke about. I'll tell you, though, the other one, I honestly think when it comes to looks, I think the silver leghorns might have a step up on the brown. The silvers are stunning birds. That's like the tie break right there. Like, okay, the middle ground. 
But I mean, when you see there's a lot of big, and I saw this when I was doing the research, trying to figure out Gertie, oh. brown leghorn groups on Facebook. I mean, they're fierce. They yes. love those chickens. They do. They really do. I also found some old bound copies of a journal called Leghorn World. The whole journal is Leghorns. Leghorn World. Right? And these dated from the 1920s. And you know a bird is popular when they have a whole journal all to themselves. Oh, yeah. Leghorns were pretty much the perfect storm for people in the early 1900s. Because, you know, they lay a lot of eggs. They lay white eggs, which were in fashion in the 1920s. I was going to say, back then... They were poo-poo on the brown eggs. They did yeah. not want the brown eggs. They wanted the white. It was prestigious to have a white egg layer. And they claimed it looked cleaner and more hygienic. I mean, this is the 20s and 30s when you think of like cold, sterile hospitals. You know, exactly. Was, they laid the white eggs, which were in fashion. They're easy to raise from chicks. They make great showbirds. And they were readily available. You can get them. That's my thing. You got to yeah. be able to get them. Articles in the journals were actually pretty funny. They included advice to farm wives to leave the breakfast dishes piled on the table and get out there to take care of your brooding baby leghorns first thing in the morning. Seriously? It's 1920, <laughs> Chris. Yeah. There were other articles about the best bloodlines, whether or not breeding rose comb to straight comb leghorns was acceptable. That would make me laugh. Yeah. Why you should feed chicks buttermilk. <laughs> Tons of ads for leghorns of all colors and important bloodlines, including the beautiful browns. Okay, so let's go into the brown leghorns and what they kind of look like. Here we go. They're small body birds with a narrow breast and an upright tail. That's the leghorn build. Yeah. That's what they look like. Roosters are generally weighing in around four to six pounds where the hens are about four to four and a half pounds. That's right on. Yep. That's where they're going to be. They have yellow legs and feet, which will dull as they get older. They yeah, they, they fade a bit. Yeah, and they have either rose combs or large and often floppy straight combs and white earlobes. That's very important. If yeah. you think that you have a brown leghorn and that chicken does not have white earlobes, you do not have a brown leghorn. You might have a well summer. <laughs> you right. <laughs> it, could, it could be yeah. You know, so the hens are pretty. They're. Almost partridge color in appearance, which is really pretty. It's one of my favorite colors for chickens or color varieties. It's a partridge. You know, it's always been one of my favorites. I mean, I love anybody who follows us on socials know that I love getting chickens in the sun and making those colors pop. And when you have a partridge chicken, the gold undertones in those feathers, they're as pretty as the green sheen in the darker chicken. Oh, yeah, it can be. It can be. If you can get those gold undertones in the partridge to pop, you're good. So, but they don't carry the partridge gene. Hmm. So they have a red breast, brown wing, and body feathers with dark stippling. Black and red, gold lace neck feathers. It's stunning. Are you listening to all these different colors? I mean, in all these different things, they're beautiful. They're labeled the brown leghorn, but that's not exactly not what they right. are. And these are just the hens. You haven't even gotten to the roosters yet. I know. So they're often mistaken for, well, summers, yes. of course. And the roosters have a black breast, gold and copper hackle and saddle feathers, and black to iridescent green. So you put the the boys, you add in the green sheen. Right. So right. that's a magical color combination right there. You know, I'm not sure about this. I know that they do have some black on the ends of their tails. I wonder if that turns green or if it's just. I think any black feathering has yeah. the ability. And, you know, when the light uh, hits we've, it. we've been getting so many comments and people, you know, like the green sheen and the feathers of our chickens. It really does go back to nutrition. Yes. And I mean, keep that in mind. If you feed something really good for them, that green sheen is going to come out. I actually feel it. like it's a combination of nutrition and a low stress environment. It allows yeah. them to thrive. It really does. Okay. So drum roll, please. Da -da 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 -da. Let's go into the brown leg horn hens and their egg laying ability. They are excellent layers, which we know that they would be. Right. They're giving you about 250 to 300 large white eggs per year. Yep. Now. They cannot be beat. And here's the thing. They're not a hybrid. 
their body is built to lay these eggs. So right. Leghorns will not have the reproductive, the vent prolapse problems, all these problems that hybrids have. Leghorns do not because their body is designed to do this. Right. So there are production strains and the production strains, they tend to be the top layers, but they're not hybrids. You're absolutely right. So with numbers of 250 to 300 eggs, there's always this controversy of, is it too much for this chicken to lay? This chicken, it, it's not. So, you know, this chicken was born and bred this way. I think the confusion comes in because there are strains that are production strains and they're usually white. That's usually a white leg horn. Right. They're not a hybrid. And I would say maybe we've never experienced anything because your Lucy has been from a really good line. Right. And I can see the possibility that maybe bad breeding could make white leg horns that are prone to problems. That's a possibility. So as with any bird, you probably want to make sure you get your stock from a really good breeder or a reputable hatchery. Here's the other thing about brown leg horns, white leg horns, doesn't matter what color. They're also not going to decrease immensely from year to year in the first few years. They are yeah. meant to lay that many eggs. If you get a hybrid chicken strictly for those high numbers of egg laying, you're going to get them in the first year and a half, potentially two years. And then after that, it's dropping off to next to nothing. So, I mean, it's still a good number, but not what you would want. So right. what I'm saying essentially is this is the chicken. If you want egg laying in a natural way yeah, without yeah. the potential of a lot of reproductive problems, this is the chicken for you. Absolutely. So one of the things that kept the brown leghorns from being pushed into the industrial egg laying thing, if we think about it, is the fact that they they didn't do well in cages as well as the white leghorns did. Because even though they're all leghorns, there still are some differences between the color varieties right. in a lot of different genetic mm -hmm. ways. I thought this was really fascinating. There's even a term for the problem they have. It's called cage layer fatigue. And we found this in a series of studies that took place between the 1940s and the 1960s. That's the heyday of industrial right. farming. Oh, yeah. And they were looking at the brown leghorn versus the white leghorn. Now, the most direct of these studies is a 1962 study that was published in the journal Research in Veterinary Science. They found a genetic issue in, in the brown leghorn hens where they developed severe and often fatal osteoporosis, even when they were supplied with adequate sources of calcium. That's from being caged, no doubt. Yeah, right. Essentially, the brown leghorn hens used in production laying had a genetic trait that would cause their bodies to convert so much of their bone mass to eggshell production that they would collapse and or die. So sad. It's it so is. sad. I mean, I don't talk about it much, but I, I am a fifth generation chicken farmer. Right. My great grandparents came over from Italy. Your grandfather My was the egg man of Little Italy. Of Baltimore. He was known as the egg man of Little Italy. Yes, yes. And my mom grew up on a chicken farm with hundreds and hundreds of leghorns. Okay. Right. They were of the white variety and Rhode Island reds, but, and he sold the eggs. It's just kind of crazy to me that this chicken at some point had to be pushed even more into industrialization. They did fine right. on their own. Like, yeah, okay, exactly. I wanted to say, stop, stop messing with them. They're naturally great. Let's not push it even further to the point where we caged them so much that they collapse because all the calcium is going to making their eggs. Right. I mean, that, that factor right there made the brown leghorns unsuitable for production laying and really much less desirable, even unusable in a hybrid layer cross. It was actually a blessing for this chicken, to be honest it, with you. It kept them out of battery cages. It did. Yeah. I mean, you look at the white leghorn so abused in these situations right. because they could handle it. And this chicken, okay, the fact that they had this genetic trait was a blessing because they didn't have to go through it. Apparently so. I mean, it, it really kept them in the heritage breed status and out of the whole industrial egg scene. It's sad. It's so sad to me. It is. It's It's sad. It's sad anytime an animal is treated as a commodity and just pushed to a place where they're not treated like a living thing anymore. 
I mean, at this point, like my my great grandparents, I had the farm they had on, but those chickens lived in a life. They right. lived their life. They were not in battery cages. No, not at all. And they still supplied all the eggs for Little Italy and Baltimore. And yes, they were between the 40s and the 60s. That's exactly when they That's were. Right. And they also had Rhode Island Reds. So they sold both white and brown eggs. They white did. And, bro- and Rhode Island Reds. Yeah. Yes. And they just got heritage breed top layers. Yeah. You know? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited to have these two girls arrive and, and really spend some time getting to know the other Leghorns because now, Lucy, Lucy is delightful. I'm going to ask you a million dollar question right now. I'm going to interview you with a million dollar question. Maybe I'll have a million dollar answer. <laughs> <laughs> now, Holly Ann, yeah. which are you more excited about coming? Are you more excited Do about not. your Leghorn? No. <laughs> are not. you more excited about your geese? I'm equally excited. That's not an answer. <laughs> can't pick between my babies. Well, you were very excited about both. I wanted to know if there's a difference in, in which one you're more excited about. Why are you trying to cause trouble over there? <laughs> you're trying to get in there and stir that pot. Ooh. I'm, I'm very excited about both of them. I <laughs> don't know which stirring over here. <laughs> okay, so these beautiful birds... They are excellent. Let me tell you, excellent for homesteads. Absolutely. They're excellent show birds. They are great as part of a laying flock. And they're a great addition for that chicken lady out there or chicken guy. Absolutely. And they're so beautiful. Leghorns have that, we talk about it all the time, unfortunate reputation for flightiness, but we know that they can become affectionate and friendly if handled regularly from the time that they are chicks. And love car rides. Lucy loves car rides. Raise your hands up if you are pro Leghorn of every color. Yes, we are. We are. Is everybody, unless you're driving, don't put your hands off the wheel. Put your hands up. Yeah. Leghorns also make a really wonderful addition to a permaculture or regenerative ag system. They love to scratch and forage. They love to turn over the dirt. Lucy never stops. I know. Ever. No, I know. She's never still. She's still here. Like, what's going on? Exactly. You're like, there's a problem. Yeah. As we mentioned earlier, they do very well in the heat because they have those big combs, the waddles to let the heat off and they don't have a lot of body fluff, but they will absolutely need support and frostbite protection in frigid weather. Yes. If you're going to have cold, they're going to need some protection. There's no, I mean, they don't have fluff. They don't have that fluff to keep them warm, they and they have big combs and waddles. They if need you look protection at them for Fluffy Butt Friday. They just have this narrow little butt. Little it, it, it's not a good Fluffy Butt Friday. It's one not. Friend. It's very cute, but it's not like the big fluffy girls. Okay, so everyone right now is like, I need a brown Leghorn. I need a white Leghorn. I need silver, silver Leghorns. We need to tell you where you need to go to get these chickens because we want you to have them too. So let's tell everybody where to get the brown leghorns. Well, you're in luck because McMurray Hatchery carries both the straight comb and the rose comb brown leghorns, as well as some other really beautiful colors, including that silver. Yes. So you are in luck. You go to McMurray Hatchery. No need to go any further. Well, if you go to McMurray, your brown leghorn may be the sister of my brown leghorn. I know. I told you. Be another de Medici girl. Maybe. I got a white lake horn over here that's going to be jealous if I get another one right now. It's okay. You can also check in with the American Brown Leghorn Club. They do have their own club. And you can check the Livestock Conservancy's Breeders Directory. I love the white lake horns. I love the bre- I love all the Mediterraneans. I feel like people are avoiding white eggs and they really shouldn't because white eggs are fantastic. And I feel like these birds are misjudged. Get yourself a leghorn. You won't regret it. It's the flighty thing that comes up. Everybody thinks you can't handle them. I'm here to tell you, you can. And yeah, get yourself whatever color leghorn you want and love them and hug them every day because they will let you do it. Exactly. Okay. So if you have leghorns, flood us with your leghorn pictures. We want to see them. Send them over. Or put a story up, hit that mention button, and then put our name in, and then we can reshare. It'll send it over and we'll reshare your story. And then in the end of April, we're going to start spamming you with my baby leghorns. 
What about the geese? They're arriving the end of May. I know, I was just joking. Ah, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Troublemaker. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. They're back with an innovative new product. You're going to want to check this out. It's an extra large set, a 14-pound feeder in three-gallon water with steep anti-roost lids. They're made of super durable material. You can either stand them on legs or hang them on brackets on your coop or fence. They're easy to remove and clean too. Plus, they look awesome. We personally use Roosties and we're huge fans. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, check out the Roosties store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. UK chicken lovers, this one's for you. Get happy, healthy hens with Eco Nourish's live calcium worms. Enrichment, nutrition, and protection in one tasty, sustainable pack. Scientifically proven to support glossy feathers, strong laying and skeletal health, protect from disease, and improve gut health and immunity. You'll also bust flock stress by stimulating natural instincts and get eco bragging rights. Visit econourish.co.uk and use the code COFFEE15 for 15% off your first order. Your chickens and the planet will hug you for it. Okay, so are we ready to move on to main topic? Yeah! Yeah! Okay, today we have a really wonderful guest joining us. We have Casey Morris. Casey is making her publishing debut with one of the best books I have read in ages, it's called Love and Chickens, and it's like the APA meets Jane Austen, and I cannot say enough good things about this book. We love it so much. Casey, welcome to the show. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Anytime. I mean, anytime somebody sends us romance reads, we're going to read it. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be on the show. Oh, it's of our pleasure. Of course. Of course. Of course. First of all, the amount of chicken information and detail in this book just set our hearts aflutter. We just love it. You have got to be a chicken lady. We knew it. We knew it from the beginning. Yeah. So right now we only have 21, but I'm hoping to get some more chicks this year. And we also have 10 geese and two ducks at the moment and one guinea. So it's a nice, respectable sized flock. <laughs> you are a proper chicken lady. What kind of ducks do you have? To be honest, I'm not a major duck expert. I'm not really sure what they are. I got them in the leftover duck bin at Tractor oh. Supply. So, <laughs> Fair enough. Have you ever shown your poultry before? I have not. Most of mine are backyard mixes or just locally bred, not show quality chickens. But I went to the Ohio National for the first time in November in 2023 because my mother lives in Ohio. So I drove up that weekend to visit her and dragged her with me. And she's not a chicken lady at all. So she's, you know, she calls them her her grandbabies and enjoys seeing pictures, but knows nothing about them. So I dragged her to the Ohio National and I was just blown away by all of the birds and seeing what show quality birds really look like. And then two weeks later, I woke up at six in the morning and just had this idea for a chicken rom-com and I started writing that morning and I had I think five or ten thousand words within a day or two so I want to back up because my question is how did we not run into each other there because we were there also this year we took a road trip from Maryland to Columbus were you, you there went- this past fall or the fall before this past fall, November. Exactly. That's what yeah. I'm saying. We were there. I think, I think I went on Saturday with my mom. So we were, we were there on Friday. Friday. Okay. We were there on okay. Friday. Yeah. So I missed you guys, but it was, I mean, it was amazing. I think it was the biggest year ever. I think over 10,000 entries. So you must have been writing like your fingers were on fire. <laughs> I mean, that just happened and I'm holding the finished book in my hand. Yeah. I, I think I wrote it all in about like two and a half weeks, which is, 
crazy for me because normally if I'm I'm writing something, it takes me a lot longer, but it just kept pouring out. You were quite inspired by those chickens. You're like, they are just pouring love out. I need to get this on paper. Come on. I need to get this out. Yes, definitely. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. I mean, I'm not kidding when I say I loved this book. I love this book. And I'm so amazed that somehow between November and February, when you're talking to us, you wrote and published this book. With the holidays, with the holidays there and everything. And you wrote a book and you have a farm that's, you told us, 41 acres with all these animals. Wow. We're impressed. We're impressed, Casey. Well, normally um, during the winter, I don't know, I just, because it's darker, <laughs> we're inside a lot more. So yeah. it is usually when I try and do more creative things and look up new egg recipes and and things like that. So just kind of sit in the darkness with my laptop for hours and write. That's pretty cool. You went to the Ohio Nationals, which is a sight to behold. I mean, it's- And it inspired you. It's a pilgrimage that every chicken lover should make at least once in their life. I mean, it really is kind of mind blowing. I feel like if you don't show chickens, it doesn't matter. You need to go and see what these breed standards look like. So once you get there and- Holly Ann and I were talking, we both have salmon favorols. We've never seen salmon favorols this way in our lives, and we've had them for many years. You need to see the chicken at the proper breed standard. And over 10,000 birds at this at the Ohio Nationals, it it is inspiring. It does inspire. And it, obviously, you started writing like you had fire in your fingers because it's poured out of you. It's just amazing. This is me talking as a former librarian. Give us the elevator pitch for the book so people know a little bit what it's about. So the very short pitch that came to mind right away when I started writing it was that it's basically like Allie Hazelwood meets Best in Show and the Chicken People documentary with a dash of pride and prejudice. Allie Hazelwood, if you are not familiar with her books, writes romantic comedies that are kind of considered steminist. So that's science, technology, engineering, and math. And so she has these female protagonists who are, you know, physicists, engineers, they're very involved in the scientific world. But the nice thing about her books is that you don't have to know anything about that field to still enjoy them. So I was hoping to do that for chicken people. And I think so far with early chicken readers, I've been pretty successful. People seem to really enjoy it. And then people who don't have chickens are still enjoying it and able to appreciate it. Well done. I felt like there was some, I'm a huge fan of Helen Fielding. I felt like there was some Bridget Jones diary in there too. I love it. Love it. Yeah. That's one of my, my favorite movies as well. So I'm sure probably in part, I was influenced by that. I'm really into movies, TV and and reading all sorts of genres. So did you have to do a lot of research on the various breeds or are you kind of a breed nerd yourself? Um, I'm not a massive breed nerd. So going to the Ohio National was definitely informative just for seeing how much I didn't know about chickens, just as someone who has a backyard flock. And I partly wanted to drop in some breeds that I knew about and think are beautiful. And then I wanted to look up some obscure breeds as well, just so people who maybe have those chickens can see them in print. And then people who know nothing about chickens who happen to be reading the book will realize just like what a diverse world it is. I think a lot of people who don't know anything about poultry think, you know, you have just a couple different types of chicken, or maybe there's just a chicken. A lot of people don't know the difference between like a broiler and an egg layer or a heritage breed. So I was hoping to just show what a rich world it really is. I love your use of bantams because, I mean, you're obviously at the show, you see there's a million bantams there. That's what showing is about, all those cool bantam breeds. And you're like, where did these come from? How did these exist? One million bantam leghorns, bantam New Hampshire's, bantam Rhode Island Reds, bantam, bantam, bantam. And you bring that into the book, which is amazing. I kind of want to touch on the fact that you started with your flock as a COVID chicken mom. And we've talked a few shows ago, basically about the trend of that. And the thing I love is you're still doing it and you love it. And it inspired you to write a book and publish it and have it out there. That is inspirational to me. That is something that I really love. And that's the whole idea of chickening is to bring people in, 
and keep them in and then have it change their world. And it, you're the perfect example. It's amazing. Yeah, I never thought I would become a chicken person. Because again, I didn't really know much about it until we got more land and I convinced my husband that we needed six chickens because wouldn't it be nice to have fresh eggs? And then as we just kept adding to the flock because I wanted more eggs of different colors, I wanted different breeds, I just really fell in love with them, just their personalities. And I don't know, it's just, it's a lifestyle, which sounds kind of, I don't know, silly maybe to say, but I think other chicken people will get it that it's not just you have chickens, like that becomes part of you. And they were definitely my gateway bird into the geese, which I originally wanted one goose to help protect the flock. And then it was, oh, well, the goose, you know, they need friends. So let's get a couple more. And then I was like, let's get goose eggs. Wouldn't that be fun to try? And it's just kind of ballooned from there. And it's been really amazing. What are some of the chicken breeds that you keep right now? So we have a lot of just sort of backyard mixes. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say predominantly we have red sex links and Easter eggers. We have a couple olive eggers as well. And then my favorite hen is named Antonia and she's a speckled Sussex and she's just, she's so beautiful. So, and she knows she's, she's the favorite. <laughs> they are wonderful birds. Just wonderful. We both have speckled Sussex. We totally love them. I think they get a bad rap sometimes for being, you know, not as assertive as they really are. They're really great chickens. Mine is Katie T biscuit and I call her the <laughs> game warden of the run. So I, I, she doesn't fall into that, like, you know, pretty as a flower, doesn't do anything. She's a game warden, you know, but she's beautiful. So that's awesome. So this book is a romantic comedy. It is set in modern day. I love that you travel around. You go to England for a while. I love that part of the book. Really fantastic. There's some intrigue in there. There's some dirty play happening. I mean, it really is a, it's a, it's an easy read in that it's just a quick moving plot. I mean, seriously, as a former librarian, I got to tell you, I would be, if I were still a librarian, I would be book chatting this to everyone all the time because I love it that much. That's a compliment coming from Holly Ann. And they don't come very often. Just know that. When it comes to literary stuff, that librarian really look at things and coming from her, that says a lot. I mean, the book is amazing. I love the fact that there's best friends in the book. And so we one always does different accents and can't get them right. No, she's she's being kind. <laughs> Patricia always does bad <laughs> accents. I love the Patricia. Patricia was actually, I don't know, I just figured, I always like to give my character sort of someone to speak to about other things happening. And Patricia was one of the most fun characters to write. And I kind of missed her when... Madeline goes to England and just kind of has phone contact with her. And if this book does well, I'm, I'm thinking about maybe doing another one potentially related to Patricia or her daughter in some capacity and maybe focusing on geese a little bit more. So that's sort of I, kind of going around in the back of my mind. I, I really that. could relate to Patricia because if you listen to the show, I do bad accents almost <laughs> every single show. <laughs> it's so All the time. And as soon so, as Madeline, like, come on, give this girl a break. She, she, she does a bad accent. It's all, it's all good. I laughed out loud when Madeline says to Patricia, what are you trying to be Australian? Because <laughs> every week when we do the show, I don't even know what these sounds coming out of Chrissy's mouth are supposed to be. <laughs> I love Patricia, too, because she raises Sebastopol geese, which are magical. You were at the, the Nationals. The Sebastopols at the Nationals this year were like, it was like Swan Lake. It was amazing. I think that's where my infatuation with them began, despite already having geese. Like now I'm convinced that I need to add some Sebastopols too, because they're just like little clouds floating around. So they're just they're so, they're so beautiful. Gorgeous. They're harder to get, though. You really have to be up like early in the year to get that order in because they are the most wanted goose out there, basically. So McMurray Hatchery, you got to try them early because they will sell out pretty quickly. I'm just taken by you because I really do love the fact that you're joining in on our lifestyle of the chicken lady and then writing a book so that all the chicken ladies can enjoy it because who doesn't enjoy a romance novel? Because at the end of the day, when you sit down and you put your feet up, you want something that you love to read and it's not a long read. It's something like watching a show and you're just turning page after page. And that's what your book is. I love the fact that you love chickens. 
Yeah, I definitely I wanted the book to be just like a fairly short, quick, lighthearted read. And I touch on a few different themes in there. The main character has had an accident, so she uses a cane sometimes. And there's some different references to different people's traumas and past, but it's definitely overall, I would say, somewhat of a fluffy book. I wanted it to be feel good, lighthearted, and to make people smile and be happy. So I'm happy that you guys felt that that was you how it worked, hit that so. mark 100 not only is there a really fun romance for the people there's also a chicken romance that happens <laughs> and that's wonderful it's very special <laughs> we talked about that this morning early this morning over coffee i was like it's i didn't quick, know we quick. were gonna bring that up though i mean because chicken <laughs> romance i mean there could have been you know i know but we were it was early this morning we were talking we were both drinking our coffee and i said i'm so happy for this beautiful little old English game bantam, she found herself an English looker and, you know, all is well that ends well. Does the bulk have a really <laughs> accent like, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> Casey, have yeah. you thought about writing this into a screenplay? I do have a friend who is a screenwriter and we have another project sort of going on. I have to be cast as Patricia. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think you can do the accents. It'll be very authentic. <laughs> so if you if you were going to cast George Cooper and Madeline, who would you choose to be your actors if you could? Oh, I haven't thought about this yet. Okay. I'm sorry. To I, put do, you I do enjoy doing these things where I sit down and I pick out people. I'm Patricia. I already I know that. I'm Patricia. Say, yeah. So we'll have you. We'll have you. <laughs> Patricia. Yeah. Done. <laughs> you get to be a movie star. What the <laughs> Just because you do bad accents, somehow that doesn't seem right. Maybe you yeah. can be Sarah. You can be that <laughs> Sarah. That's what we prefer. <laughs> I, I want to be that <laughs> Sarah. It's funny. I have a friend named Sarah. Mm-hmm. And actually, our dog is named Madeline. So, like, I'm not great at picking names. <laughs> oh, my and God. Some I love chicken, it. Some of the chickens in the book have... um just like names of my chickens, like or horses or just different animals. So there's a lot of little Easter eggs in there for people who who know me. You- there's a reference when she's watching true crime that there is like a an heiress who kills her polo playing boyfriend in Virginia. Like that is a real thing that happened like down the road. So that's like I was like, oh, I'll just throw that in there. So do you know someone who has or do you have a bird that's Lucius the fourth? I do not, but I <laughs> studied classics and classical archaeology in school. And so I think you'll notice probably there's a handful of names in there that are Roman or Greek sounding. And of my chickens that are named, and unfortunately I have not named all of them anymore, is once I hit my peak of 40 something about a year or two ago, I just couldn't keep up with names. But the ones that do have names usually have a Roman inspired name. So we have an Antonia, we have a Claudius. We used to have a Pericles who was like my favorite rooster. He was a blue laced red Wyandotte. And he was actually my first free chick when I ordered in the mail and said, yes, send me the free chicken. I was like, that's amazing. They're sending out free chickens. Usually a boy, just know that for sure. <laughs> yes, yeah, I didn't I didn't know that at the time. I was like, just that's so exciting. There's a free chicken. I was like, look at this dear husband. They're sending me free animals. <laughs> okay, so here we go. We're only two hours apart. So you need to drive an hour. We need to drive an hour and have coffee. And we can have coffee over with our accents. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck is that? I'm not sure what that accent was. She tried to do one that was Dutch a few <laughs> months back and... I don't even know. I was like, what's wrong with your mouth? What's happening over there? I think we were met to meet Casey. Casey is like a kindred spirit of ours here. I know. Clearly. That would actually be really fun. I don't know. Meet up with other chicken people. You guys seem like so much fun. (laughs) We're good on a road trip. Let me tell you. (laughs) We are the queens of the road trip. So you're revolving some plans maybe for another book involving poultry. Did you like it so much that you could see yourself doing a whole series of poultry romances? I think so. Definitely. It just was such a fun, quick write for me as well, because I was so invested in it. I mean, I would wake up at six in the morning and write for an hour before I started work and stay up late. And I just, I don't know, I think definitely my next idea is about geese as sort of the centerpiece. But I could see potentially an entire series about poultry or just sort of farm life in general. Wonderful. 
what else do you do on your farm? Are you just keeping the poultry? Or are you doing any gardening, homesteading, that sort of thing? We have a lot of horses mostly. So we're just, we're big horse people. And then I'm kind of a failed beekeeper. So I've been trying to do for a couple of years now, treatment free bees and just keep them very naturally. And it is not going well. I have one hive that they're the nastiest bees I have ever met. Because I accidentally bought Russian bees without knowing. Yeah, yeah, Russian. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I went to dinner with a really close friend. We went, my husband and I met some close friends a week or so ago for dinner. And my friend says to me, you, well, you need to get bees. And I'm like, I'm afraid of getting stung. I'm definitely not getting bees. That's not on my, that's not in my horizon, my future. No. no yeah, no, no. I've gotten, I've gotten stung one too many times, even with my protective equipment. Like the very first bees I started with were Italians. They were very nice, very gentle. I could pull up a frame and take a picture with no gloves. <laughs> exactly. And then I got the Russian bees and it was like, they were biting through like my suit or <laughs> thingy, not biting. And I would just be like running around screaming. And I am, I think, mildly allergic. That's not good. So like one time I got into my like veil and stung me on the face. And I was like, I looked like an abused woman. Like I couldn't leave the house for a week. You so said you, you went out to the store and they said, what happened to you? And you said a bee stung me. They're like, no, please <laughs> tell us. Help. There's this card. <laughs> Link twice. The sign. You, the sign. Yes, yeah, the, the sign. Do you need no, assistance? I think like, I definitely, I have trauma from the bees. Like it was, it is nice having honey. And I feel like, oh, I'm helping the environment. But at what cost to my sanity? And Go back to the Italians. <laughs> Italians are the best anyway, right? Italians well, they are were, amazing. But they were so like lazy, if you can say bees are lazy. <laughs> It's all about that laid back lifestyle of the Italian. It was. So they, <laughs> so when we first got the bees, I didn't think about the fact that we have bees. And so we didn't set up an electric fence. So they were doing really well. And then one night they were just, they were decimated and the queen had died. I found her body. And so oh. I spent the entire summer trying to get them to make a new queen. And that they just awful. like couldn't do it. Like they just couldn't. I don't know, organize themselves to like do it. I kept giving them frames from like other bees that have all the eggs. Like all they had to do was groom a new queen and they just like wouldn't do it. So they they died out. And then the they're Russians are still here. Russians came later, in, of like, course. Like, yeah, the, the Russians, Russians are like... <laughs> <laughs> would the Russians be happier if you had offered them vodka? I don't know, maybe. I don't know what they want. I just... Vodka honey. I let do you know them do their could, own thing. <laughs> if you made vodka honey, you could sell that like no tomorrow. Like, I would I would consume vodka honey. <laughs> I would. <laughs> Very happily. Like, oh it's my, my gosh, in the morning. It's my Russian bees, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, tell us, are you cooking or baking with your goose eggs? And how is that going? Yeah, so I love goose eggs. I actually... Even though I love my chickens, I have to say that I really enjoy the taste of goose eggs and I enjoy the size of them, that they're about the size of three chicken eggs. So I mostly I'll do like a giant over easy egg just because I don't know. I think it's cool. I always take a picture and that's fun. Show it to all the non bird people and they're like, what the heck? And I'll just do scrambled eggs or I'll, I'll bake with them. So, okay. I look forward to the goose eggs. I think it's going to be fun. Now we should ask Casey if she has a favorite egg recipe that we can develop something. Now, you know, we develop recipes every single week for the show. So we sit down and brainstorm and figure out how can you use these eggs? So maybe around your your episode, we can do an, one of your favorite egg recipes. And if Holly, like Holly probably wants to do a goose or... But I can't spot. get my hands on goose eggs yet. So it ha we have to do chicken for now. We have to do chicken eggs. You can come visit. I'll give you some goose eggs. <laughs> We're coming to visit. <laughs> Patricia's going to knock on the door and say, well, yeah, can you please pour the tea? Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I just, I made egg souffle this morning, which I've never made before. Ooh, and I did them in like, oh my God, I found a recipe because I don't like to separate out the whites because I'm just, I'm really lazy. I made them in like a little muffin pan. I'm thinking like, oh yeah, like that's cool. Ones. Easy recipes. Essentially, you did out. individual soufflés in the little pan. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's gonna. Yeah, we'll we'll develop that. I like that. We're we'll do come. that. Yeah. And it used six know. chicken eggs, so it was like a nice use of a large number that's of eggs. So, like, if you use goose eggs, it would be like about two goose eggs instead. So, we should name it something from the book, Patricia. 
<laughs> the Patricia. Not the Patricia. The D- Patricia Souffle. I do either of you have a minivan? I did, Patricia and it died driving. a few months ago. Yes, so you are Patricia. <laughs> She's kind of Patricia. Like, I mean, she really, she, Patricia gave me heavy Chrissy vibes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're like, have you listened to us? Are we based on these characters? Like, come on. <laughs> you know, I'm definitely getting strong Patricia vibes from you. It's I all about Patricia. want to be that <laughs> Sarah, because Sarah's <laughs> geese, Sarah's geese beat Patricia's geese so bad <laughs> for like six months. And I love that. Yeah, they, love they definitely we do have a little bit of competition problems but yeah uh, i mean (laughs) it's all good it's all good it's all good (laughs) so this is your debut novel you've done other writing but this is your debut publishing i should say what's your background do you have a background in literature or have you just tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you got into this so i've always enjoyed reading and writing i was one of those kids who you know would just sit there and read books all the time I studied classics in undergrad. I went to Princeton and mostly was on the the Roman side of that. So I studied a lot of Latin and Roman history. So really enjoyed that. Went to grad school in England for a master's in classical archaeology. So my wow. background is kind of in archaeological excavations and museum work. And for a long time, I kind of thought that is what I wanted for a career path. But when it came time to look for jobs, a lot of those opportunities were in New York City or other metropolitan areas. And I just was not into moving to an urban area. I've grown up with a lot of animals, have always been into horses. Now I'm much more in a a farm life with poultry and a variety of other animals. And I just couldn't see myself giving things like that up to pursue career opportunities in a city. You're doing what brings you passion. And I like that because your life, you, you're you being passionate about something and your life is revolving around it. And that's kind of the key to happiness, right? So you know you have all these things. I mean, wow, you have credentials like Princeton, going to England for master's, all these things. But you meet chickens and you're like, it's all over. I'm, right, I'm writing a rom-com for chickens. This is, this is where it is right now. And you're doing it. I love that. I love it. Do you have sheep? Oh, we do not yet. I've been trying to convince my husband for like a while that we need sheep because they're really good for rotational grazing with the horses, with all the parasites. So I have them. I have sheep. That's why oh. I want you to be our new bestie because you're amazing. Holly Ann! Wait, Holly Ann! Our new bestie. We can share her. I said our new bestie. I don't, what type of sheep do you have? I have three Jacobs that were rescued. Okay. I have three Hog Islands from Mount Vernon. They're non-breeders from the Mount Vernon estate. And I have four of these tiny little French sheep called croissants. They're the smallest breed in the world. And who drove 17 hours with you round trip in one day to get those sheep? Patricia. (laughs) In the minivan. Yes, I did. Now call me my tea. In my Subaru. They were actually in the back of my Subaru. Yes. (laughs) We drove up to Boston, got our sheep and brought them back. Yeah. But I love them. They're all three of those breeds are fantastic browsers so they keep everything clipped down and they really are fantastic but i was wondering because you know we 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 love everything about you so i i knew there had to be a sheep woman in there somewhere and i I really i would really like to get columbia sheep which like just like they were so massive because we do have a coyote problem here if we ever get sheep i want like massive things columbia's are gorgeous sheep with really pretty wool and they have these really handsome heads it would be perfect for your roman names want emus but i haven't convinced the husband on emus they're on my list of most wanted farm animals i mean if you have 41 acres you have room for kind of whatever you want at this point as long as you have like the structure and all that stuff emus don't don't have a preen gland just so you know emus can't preen they don't have a preen gland i didn't know just a little bit of super geek trivia that i'm giving you (laughs) since you're interested in emus i can prepare myself You won't catch your emus preening. So there we go. <laughs> well, in 10 years, when you finally get an emu, it won't preen. Like, oh, yeah. I wrote that weird podcast lady that had just random bizarre facts. And she said there's a preen gland with an emu. And that'll be stuck in my mind now for forever. <laughs> so we're, we have a rare, we have a very unfair question to ask you, but we'll get to that in a minute. Because the first thing we want to tell people is where to find you and where to find your book. 
I will have the book listed in the show notes connected to Amazon so you can go right to it and buy it. And I highly suggest you do it. But where can people follow you for more upcoming fun? So right now I'm most active on Instagram at Casey Morris writes. And then I also have a website, which is CaseyMorris.com. I've been trying to get on TikTok, but I'm just not really vibing with it. I think I'm too old already or something. So it's, I don't know. (laughs) Casey Morris writes is your Instagram and what's your website? I'm sorry. CaseyMorris.com. CaseyMorris.com. Okay. So our final question to you today. Casey, what is your favorite breed of chicken? I know we know this is completely unfair, but we ask every guest that comes on the show. Even though I don't have any, I'd have to say silkies. I've become obsessed with them ever since seeing some in person, and I desperately want them. They are beautiful chickens. And I think now that you have a few years of chickening under your belt, I think that you would be pretty well equipped for silkies because silkies can have some extra stuff that you need to know about with taking care of them and everything. So I can see you as a great silky mom. Thank you. (laughs) And they do have a preen gland, but it doesn't do them any good. (laughs) Just the concern is like, they're adorable and I want them, but I'm like, would it just kind of become a house chicken? Like, would I be giving it baths all the time? Like, I don't know. They are definitely higher maintenance. I mean, we have a, a friend, a longtime patron of the show, and a, a friend, Carla, who keeps four stunningly beautiful silkies, but they do live indoor, outdoor. Yeah. Because they're, I mean, they're the fanciest of the fancy. Other than the Sultan. The Sultan right. is the fanciest of all. But the silky, they they are a chicken that needs provisions. They need, they can't really get wet. They they have to come in. They can't deal with cold very well. And sometimes they can have some problems. But an experienced person that once, you know, can do a really good job of taking care of self You know, a covered Ron, some pampering, they'll be fine. I thought you were going to say some pants. I was like, they could have pants. <laughs> pants, too. just dress them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just dress them, they'll be fine. Just dress them up. So we want to thank Casey for coming on and spending this hour with us. We think that Holly Ann has found a new kindred spirit, which I should be jealous about. I think I got a problem here. But I'm jealous uh, about you're gonna be a movie star. <laughs> Patricia. I need the minivan back. The transmission died, but get it back for me. Come on. I do kind of like your new car though. Casey, is there anything else you want everyone out there to know about this amazing book before we let you go? I don't think so. I just I really hope people enjoy it and can maybe see themselves in it and their chickens a little bit as well we already know i see i'm patricia so <laughs> where's more patricia geese? if you're patricia you should have geese well i have a husband who's not going to let me have geese okay so that's not going to happen casey thank you for joining us for a super fun hour we love this book go get this book everyone you're gonna love it you are gonna love it go get this book it's gonna be on our amazon storefront And be looking for a really fun giveaway. We all love a great giveaway. So go ahead over to our social media and check it out. Get your copy of Love and Chickens by Casey Morris. Casey, thank you. We'll talk to you later, Casey. Thank you so much for having me. Our Our pleasure. pleasure. Bye. We just want to thank Casey one more time for a super fun chat. Go get yourself a copy of this book. It is a fun read. I had so much fun talking to Casey and I cannot wait till I am casted in the movie. I am going to be in the movie. Cast in the movie. But you know who I think should be? I think that the old judge should be Hugh Grant. <laughs> I'm going to be in the movie too. She said I could be in, so I'm going to be in the movie. Well, she too. said I could too. I get to oh. be the mean, I get to be the mean one. Ha. <laughs> The mean lady with the Sebastopol geese. That's me. It was such a fun conversation. Yes. Thanks, Casey. Okay, so let's move on to... Cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. Now, this week, we're going to take little baby steps into making mini cheese souffles. Now, don't let that freak you out, the souffle thing. It's not hard. It's not bad. No, we will walk you through it. These are fantastic because, like you said, baby steps. Mm-hmm. You get some of the technique down, but you can just pop these into cupcake tins. You do not have to have a souffle pan. Thinking about souffles takes me back to when my mom would make cakes. And 
as we were little kids, we'd be running around the house. But when the cake was in the oven, you are not allowed to run around the house. <laughs> the cake will fall. She would always say, stop jumping. The cake's going to fall. Well, maybe the souffle would fall. I mean, they, <laughs> they can be pretty fragile. But like Julia Child always said, souffle falls, eat it anyway. You eat it anyway. Who cares? It, anyway. it tastes the so same. Delicious. Right. Okay, so let's go into the ingredients that we're going to need. We're going to need three tablespoons of butter or dairy-free butter, three tablespoons of flour or gluten-free one-to-one flour, three quarters of a cup of milk or plant-based milk, three quarters of a cup of shredded cheese or dairy-free cheddar, a tablespoon of Dijon mustard, Dijon, ho ho, uh, ho ho, a cup, <laughs> one cup. oh no no, I don't know. A cup of finely chopped cooked broccoli or veggie of choice. We love ourselves some broccoli. But you could do asparagus. (laughs) Or cauliflower. And you can also add some cannoli beans in there. (laughs) Okay, here we go. Four eggs, yolks and whites separated into two small to medium bowls. Yep. Okay, take it away. All righty. You're going to preheat your oven to 350 degrees. Grab yourself a muffin tin or a cupcake tin or even individual molds if that's what you have. You're going to lightly grease them and set them aside. You're going to grab a medium-sized saucepan. You're going to melt the butter in it over medium to low heat. Stir in the flour and let that cook for a minute or so. You're going to gradually add the milk, stirring the whole time to get it blended in. Continue to cook and stir until this milk-flour-butter mixture comes to a boil. Right. It's going to take a little bit of time because that yeah. does take a little bit of time. It's almost like making a roux. It's exactly like making a roux in a lot yeah. of ways. So you're going to pull it off the heat as soon as it starts to boil. And you're going to add your cheese, again, stirring the whole time until it's melted. Stir in the mustard and stir, uh-huh. in, whatever, uh-huh, and stir in whatever veg you're using. Now, the egg yolks, you're going to whisk them right before you use them. So... Set your mixture aside, whisk the egg yolks, and then you're going to temper them with that batter by the spoonful, a spoonful of the batter that's in the pot into the egg yolks, spoonful by spoonful, stir it the whole time. The reason you temper eggs is to get the egg yolks up to a warm temperature so they don't curdle. So they don't cook in there. They don't cook, exactly. So you're going to temper them a bit at a time, making sure they're completely mixed in. Once the yolks are warm enough, you can return that whole bowl to the original batter and whisk it in completely. Then you're going to beat your egg whites because that's where the lift comes from in a souffle. Right. Beaten egg whites. You're going to beat your egg whites with a mixer, a hand mixer, or you can put them on a stand mixer if you want. Beat them until you have peaks that are stiff but not dry. And if you're using the highest setting, that's probably about five minutes. Right. It takes a little bit of time. Yeah, it does. Can you imagine having to do that by hand? We did in school, if you remember that. We were talking about this before. In middle school? High school, I did it. I didn't do food science with you in high school. I had creative writing instead. Yeah, I did it. And I mean, there's a whole thing about all we learned how to do this by hand, by mixer, all of it. I've done it by hand just to try it, but it oh, it was not good. No, just use a mixer. (laughs) Just use your mixer. Once you have those... Stiff but not dry peaks. You're going to gently fold the whites into that souffle batter with the yolks in it. Pour it into your muffin pans or your cups. Bake it for 25 minutes until the souffles are puffed and set. Now, here's the thing. Do not open that door until you think they're probably done. And don't jump. I guess don't (laughs) jump, you know. And and again, if they fall, they're still delicious. Serve them anyway. They'll still taste the same. Exactly. Everyone think they're great. We looked at this as some pretty safe way to venture into souffle making. And we were talking to Casey about this during the main topic. Yeah. And she was telling us, I don't know if it was on or off when we were recording, but she was making some souffles also. Yes. Yes. This is definitely an inspired by Casey recipe. So try it. You might like it. Let us know. And if they rise or if they fall, take the pictures and send them to (laughs) us. We want to see them. We don't care. We want to see them. Okay, so let's move on to retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. If you're an 80s kid like us, 
You're going to love this week's retail therapy. If you're not, you're going to learn something. But this week's retail therapy is home interiors, vintage chickens, but just yeah. home interiors. Now, growing up, if your mom did not mention home interiors, it's always like, oh, it, that's home interiors. Don't mess that up. That's home interiors. Or I'm on QVC. That's home interiors on QVC. Like, oh, I forgot I was on QVC. <laughs> My mom was not a fan of it. And I know she was very unusual with that. Like all the neighbors had the home interior, but we did not. My mom would like, if it was on sale, home interiors, then we would get it. But if it were on sale, <laughs> then we wouldn't. But everywhere you went to like people's houses, like, oh, don't touch that. That's home interior. Interior, yeah. Home interiors and gifts was a U.S. home decor company that was in business from the 1950s through 2008. Man, they, all, they went all the way to 2008? Well, they were bought out in the 90s. And so they were folded under an umbrella company, but they were technically still in existence. So they weren't called home interiors at that point? I don't think so. I think they okay. completely switched. Now, home interiors sold goods to the public through sales reps that held home house parties. Oh, yeah. Just like, like Tupperware. Right, right. And like we said, home interiors was at the height of their popularity in the 1970s and the 1980s. Oh, yes. They sold a surprising number of chicken decor items, including figurines, wall art, framed prints, lanterns, and decorative plates. And there's even more than that. Now, they also had a lot of duck and goose stuff. Too. Of course they did. <laughs> of course. <laughs> a lot. Now, remember a couple weeks ago, I shot you a pic of these two metal chicken lanterns that I found. Yeah. In the home interior. Your home interior. Okay. There's a story of, I have to ask my mom about it again, but basically I was two and my mom had this ceramic chicken. I knew the story. Yeah. And she said she refused to put everything away. And I'm pretty sure the ceramic chicken was home interior. Okay. So. Okay. The only reason I know is I'm going to get to it in a minute, but okay. So I'm two years old. My mom's refusing to put her knickknacks away. And one of which she's she's saying she's not going to baby proof the house. Right. And she's saying the one was a home interior and get it. It was a chicken. And the story is I grabbed it and I started running and she was like, no. And I took it, I threw it against the wall. Oh, and it shattered it a million pieces. Oh man. So fast forward to like four or five years ago, I'm in Goodwill and I buy this brown ceramic chicken and I'm like, oh, I love this. And she comes to the house and she just stops dead and says, (laughs) where did you get (laughs) that? She's like, that's home interior because that's the one you broke when you were two years old. I'm like, do you want me to give you this? I really like it. She's like, no, keep it. But it was, it was like that's funny. It was like how it do you? Like, she saw a ghost knickknack. <laughs> she stopped dead in her tracks. Like, where did you get that? I glued it back together, mom. Mom, I was two. I glued it. She's like, I love that chicken, and you grabbed it. And she threw it against the wall. <laughs> well, this is what happens when you leave your knickknacks out with two-year-olds. <laughs> yeah, really. Oh man, but that's the home interior thing. <clears throat> I mean, home interior parties. You know what? There yeah. was something fun about Tupperware parties. People did it to get together. And also, kind of like egg money, women used it to make a little bit of money on the side. Right. Or also, they could get the stuff for free if they sold so much of it. And you could get the stuff. But I feel like Magic Chef started to come in in the 90s. That was similar. Yeah. I mean, Tupperware has had the test of time. That's for sure. Oh, yeah, definitely. You can generally identify home interior stuff by their mark. Especially when they're ceramic things. It's Homco, H-O-M-C-O. Yep. I feel like you're starting to see more and more Homco stuff showing up in thrift shops and on eBay and Etsy. Because kids of that age are our age now and they're going through like their parents' houses yeah. and that it's coming out now. Yep. And so you're so. seeing it. But it's like what we were talking about on pa- our Patreon episode, this is Fabergé. It's a, also another saying that you kind of put together with the 80s, right? Home interiors. Home interiors. 
That's it, fine. This, that's fine. It is fun. Don't touch that. That's from interiors. I got to tell you, I was really thrilled with those lanterns. They're adorable. Oh, yeah. And I mean, if you go to the thrift store and you look for Hoko, and here's the thing. It's now a popular again. People yeah. want it. Right. Because part of it's nostalgia. You had yeah. it growing up and now you're like, I want it back. Yeah. And the vintage chicken stuff. I mean, it never goes out of style. Really. No, no, never. It's fantastic. Never. If you fantastic. have some, send us a picture. We want to see it. Okay. Please. So should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Next week, we are spotlighting another Mediterranean breed. This is one we haven't done before. The absolutely beautiful Pena de Senka. Like the coffee. <laughs> That's Sanka, but okay. Main topic, we are talking with the wonderful Forrest Clinton from My Pet Chicken. We have so much fun talking with her. She is great. Cracking the eggs. French toast with rhubarb compote. That you can grow yourself in your garden. Absolutely. And retail therapy. Oh, one of our favorites. We are talking vintage egg cups. Because you know you got a lot of them. If not, go to the thrift store and buy some. <laughs> you want some. I'll tell you, you know, egg cups are one of those things where they might be a dollar or two, or they might be $20 each. Or 500 You never know. <laughs> okay. So what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.